so this talk is uh, Haskell in Apache Spark uh, by me. So just FYI, I'm Robin, and uh, I've been using Haskell for a long time. I am now uh, an engineering manager here in this building at Formation, and of course, we're hiring. So talk to me if you're interested in a Haskell job. Um, so Apache Spark is an interesting library right now because it, it facilitates distributed computing. Uh, very popular also for machine learning. It does run on the JVM, so it's a Java thing, and it can be used in a variety of clusters now. It claims to work well in Kubernetes, Mesos. I have experience with it in Hadoop's Yarn, and you can set it up on a, you know, none of those. So uh, if you want to write some Haskell code and have it run uh, in Spark, you can't do that because if you are tr using the trusty GHC compiler, of course, it doesn't produce Java bytecode. Um, so how to use it? That's what this talk answers. So here's a hint. You, you know Haskell, of course, has this foreign function interface, and that's used for interacting with C libraries, so for making a, a C language uh, interface to Haskell to and from and so maybe there's some opportunity here there's this other uh, thing you might not know of which is uh, switches when you compile GHC for making so-called uh, position independent executables which is what that pi is so that might not be a commonly used GHC switch but it's there and a position uh, independent executable is one where the, the compilation is modified so that the resulting binary can, if you want, be loaded much like a, a .so file, a shared library. Um, you need the dash dynamic for that too, I believe. <laughs> so there's, there's more opportunity for interop, but you know, the pieces of the puzzle aren't all there yet. But there's another one, JNI. So, the Java, Java always has this thing called Java Native Interface, and it's the same thing for Java, this opportunity to, or a method for interacting with C code to and from. And the JVM has also this uh, system.load, which does what you might expect, which is dynamically load uh, a shared object or a position-independent executable. So you see the pieces of the puzzle coming together. Here's another piece um, if you're trying to use Haskell inside of Apache Spark. Um, there's a cool package called inline Java, which is much like the inline C package if you've ever used that um, URL for it there if you want to learn more. But it does allow you to uh, call JVM functions directly from Haskell without having to write any um, explicit foreign function interface bindings. You can actually just write inline Java, just like it says you can. <clears throat> and I'm gonna give a little source code fragment here. So if, if you sort of begin, um, this didn't all fit in one slide, if you begin your uh, source code with these um, fragmas and imports, you can write a code fragment that looks like this, which take note is, um, if you look at the most indented lines, that's actually just Java. And of course, it's in uh, a block that's parsed by the Haskell code that surrounds it. Take note, of course, uh, that there's a interpolated Haskell function inside that Java code. See the system.out.print line, dollar sign text. So the text there refers to the Haskell um, bound variable above that is outside the Java block. And it has a value that has to uh, be constructed with this reflect and the sort of opposite. So, so reflect makes a sort of Java compatible Haskell value. And then below uh, there's a reify where it says X is reify J array, which is the um, line that makes the uh, array of strings that are in Java into something that makes sense in Haskell. Um, <clears throat> so the punchline of the talk is that there is this. There's a package called Sparkle, and it's, uh, it, it, does, it pieces together the pieces, uh, uh, the, the ideas that I've talked about so far in a way that is um, palatable to Haskellers. 
It's a Haskell package and enables this Haskell and Spark. And what it does is it creates a dot, it, it provides the tooling for creating dot jar files, uh, which embed your Haskell binary and all of its referred to dependencies, which is sort of a non-trivial thing to concoct as part of a build system. When it runs, it, uh, when your Haskell binary runs inside of Spark, it will automatically unpack uh, the Haskell binary and all of the dependencies uh, dynamically upon sub being submitted to the Spark cluster. And it ships them to the appropriate nodes and it dynamically loads that binary and its many dependencies, potentially many, and runs your Haskell main like it's its own main. Further, uh, Sparkle provides a great deal of uh, useful bindings to the similarly named functions that are present in Spark. And um, then you get to run your Haskell in, in Spark. And that's it. So this was a, a, an open source project created by uh, Tweak and augmented by many others, including me and many of the members who are here today who work at Leap Year Technologies. I can put them out later if you'd like. Um, and here's the repo. You can go there to find out more, to find examples. And I want to add a little bit of flavor here uh, in the form of warnings, professional uh, opinions of mine. Um, so how do, if you think about this, how does it work? You're going to dynamically load into a JVM process Haskell and all of in its runtime system. So inside a process, you're going to get sort of a complicated multi-threading environment, which is difficult to reason about, or at least requires a little bit of thinking. Uh, you're going to have two JVMs interacting in the same memory space, which surely is scary if you've ever, you know, productionized systems before. This is maybe not a good idea. Um, that said, there's some good successful uh, industrial strength uh, binaries in existence, which do precisely this. Um, you, if you want to make modifications to Sparkle bindings, you are going to have to learn a fair bit. You're going to have to understand GHC finalization logic, JNI memory management um, techniques, and so on. Um, you'll have to poke into the Sparkle internals. This is non-trivial, and you will have to go up a very steep learning curve to successfully augment or change this. If you're building something like this, you have to build a bit of, uh, you know, Java and a bit of Haskell, and Haskell is already a bit of a difficult build challenge, so now you've just made things harder for yourself. If you adopt the project, you'll have to use a powerful tool or invest in your build infrastructure. I recommend Nix, of course, if you, you know, have a build that's getting more and more complex. The Mac support for this, I've noticed, is not open sourced. Uh, I know it exists in some places, but um, if you're planning on running in production on Mac, you'll be out of luck. Probably are not, but the dev environment would be nice to, to run on Mac. Can't do that yet. And the performance, of course, is a performance degradation. You saw that there's, there tends to be code where the, which transforms from uh, one format to another, whether it's a function that's been serialized or a value that is being uh, transformed from format to format. Um, I would liken the performance to writing PySpark, which is um, quite acceptable to many. So if you if you dislike writing PySpark and you want to get Apache Spark, you want some strong types, you can get equivalent performance by switching to Haskell, making use of this library. Uh, and you can ask me more if you want to afterwards about if you're thinking about using this in an industrial way. Um, I have many opinions. Um, so I'm just going to steal a little bit of my own time here and plug the Haskell Communities and Activities Report, um, for which the deadline is Monday if you want to make a contribution. The primary maintainer, or maybe the only maintainer, is here sitting behind me. <laughs> Hi. Uh, please approach me high to learn more uh, about the H car. So that's it. That's my talk about how to do Haskell on Spark. Are there any questions? I just realized that Zoom doesn't support NixOS. But you can't download it. Oh, no, for Zoom? Yeah. Okay. Is there any way? Uh, yes, you can. 
Yeah. <laughs> Someone knows the answer. Can, right? can you come? <laughs> okay. I have a question. Okay. Um, also five minutes. But uh, uh, so, did you, in the space of Haskell on JVM, did you consider it? And um, why not go that route? Oh, so there, is there are a couple of languages which compile to the JVM to JVM byte, yes. right? Haskell like uh, Haskell like languages. languages, right? So okay. the answer is yes. Um, that's th there's sort of many ways you can get something very similar to this. Um, one of them is to use one of the tools that compile a Haskell like language to JVM, and then you're effectively a JVM shop that has the ability to write some Haskell. Uh, the other one is this route where you're sort of trying to be GHC centric and figuring out how to make that work in a, uh, uh, like a, on Spark. Um, and uh, you, I mean, you could even do other things if you wanted to go far, like if you're really interested in simply doing distributed computing in Haskell, well, you could, you know, Spark isn't actually that complicated. You could reinvent Spark with um, a large quantity of effort, but if, if you're a shop that is heavily investing into distributed computing with Haskell, that would probably, uh, in the long run, be, well, it would be better for the world, <laughs> but uh, it, you might even get uh, more correct code um, sooner if you, if you need to be like industrial strength and perfectly correct because the opportunity for error with this method is actually quite high. You have uh, things that are kind of out of your control, um, like if you have a Haskell library um, that is, you know, C, C library that's a dependency that you're actually making use of, and its memory management um, is a bit non hermetic you know, it's actually uh, buggy, but you don't know it because you happen not to see that problem. But then, when you dynamically load into the JVM, you actually kill JVM parts, um, and then you crash horribly, or or don't, and just get wrong answers. You know, it's, so there's risk. Um, yeah, so I considered each of those, but I have only experience with this. Group. I think. Yes, um, from an engineering, uh, data engineering perspective, what kind of processing loads are you actually running that led you down this path to you know, want to use Haskell on Spark? Because the Spark distributed overhead is already huge and, and often uh, unnecessary. The, the answer to that is that we wanted to, where I was working previously, we wanted to operate our um, data management product on already existing um, Hadoop clusters where the data was already spread appropriately across the nodes. And so we had this uh, like strong push in that direction because of how the data was already being collected and because it was a good way to do distributed computing. It's not the best, but um, given the sort of market constraints upon us, it made sense as a choice. For that, for the reason okay. that you know, our customers, our target customers, already had these existing uh, CR setups. Yes. Um, how did you approach instrumenting and monitoring this system? Um, I think that's a little bit outside of this talk, uh, but I can maybe answer you directly after because it's, it's not at all related to Apache and Spark. I think I'm out of time. I have two minutes, yeah. So I'll, I'll make, uh, I'll talk to you after. Yeah. Any other questions for me? Okay. Oh, there's one. Do you have any production installations? Yes. Yes, there are. They are, I can't, I guess, what can I say? I can say that they are on, uh, so it's private exactly where they are but they're in um, environments where the actual volume of data is enormous, like very big companies, banks, I can say, I suppose. Um, and the hope, of course, is to actually apply machine learning on these large volumes of data um, without it being slow. So does that sort of answer your question? Yeah, okay. It's not widely deployed to the best of my knowledge. All right, thanks everyone.